needs to start with an honest appraisal of exactly what lies we told them. What dishonesty we spread during our addictive behavior. The Buddha provided some guidelines for wise speech, in ad, dash, addition to truthfulness. He said to avoid slander and gossip, recognizing that such unwise speech causes conflict and makes the community less safe. So, when we talk about others, we can ask ourselves, what's our intention? Is it to cause division or exclusion? Is it to cause shame or em? Dash. Embarrassment in someone else, or to somehow make ourselves look better at somebody else's expense. It's possible to talk about other people with the intention of kindness, generosity, and compassion to seek under dash standing or support for another. Gossip and slander do not contribute to this and instead cause harm. Similarly, idle chatter and saying things just to be heard or recognized, or to take up time when we're uncomfortable, can lead people to dismiss or ignore us and may create impatience and intolerance in our community. Wise speech is also reflected in the tone we use when we talk. If we express ourselves in harsh, angry, or abusive ways, we may not be heard even if we're being truthful, speaking gently, with the intention of kindness, fosters a community of friendliness and safety. There are always exceptions, of course, and wise speech also includes using a loud and strong voice when you need to protect your safety. It may sound like wise speech is primarily about discerning when not to speak, but this isn't always the case. Many of us grew up in families where it wasn't safe to talk openly about our thoughts and feelings. Some, because of certain experiences or cultural conditioning, have been taught that we don't have permission to use our voices or lack the power to speak and be heard. For many of us, practicing wise speech may mean learning how to use our voices that have been silenced and to wisely communicate the needs and boundaries we've gotten used to keep. Dash. Being hidden. At times, this includes speaking up for others when harm is done. Many of us, in an effort to be liked, for fear of rocking the boat, or due to the exhaustion of repeatedly not being seen and heard, have favored being nice over being honest and true to ourselves. Wise speech teaches us that speaking up, even when it's hard, is sometimes the best choice, and that speech is never truly kind if we cause harm to ourselves. Finally, wise speech is careful listening. Dot, it is also knowing when not to speak when a wise response isn't available to us. We must listen with compassion, understanding, and receptivity. It can be really helpful to observe how much of the time we spend listening to someone else is actually spent judging them or planning what we're going to say in response. Deep listening, without selfishness, or an agenda, is an act of generosity that lets us build true connection. Inquiry of wise speech. Colon. Have you caused harm with your speech? How? Have you been dishonest or harsh in your communication? When? And in what specific ways? Do you use speech?
speech now to hurt or control people, to present a false idea or image of yourself or of reality, to demand attention, or to relieve the discomfort of silence. Detail specific instances in which you use speech to mislead, misdirect, or distract. Are you careful to avoid causing harm with your speech? Do you say things you know are not true, or pretend to know the truth about something when you don't, to appear more knowledge, dash, able or credible than you are? List some examples. Wise action. Wise action is also based in the intention to do no harm and to Foster compassion, loving kindness, generosity, and forgiveness. We try to do what's skillful and avoid actions that are unskillful. Wise action asks that we try to make choices based on understanding and not on thinking. Habits or ignorance. The Buddha suggested that we make a commitment to avoid five. Specific actions that cause harm, a commitment which is known as the Five Precepts. We commit to the Five Precepts as our basic ethical system. 1. We set the intention to avoid taking the life of another living being, or from causing harm to ourselves or another living being. 2. We set the intention to avoid taking what is not freely given, or stealing. 3. We set the intention to avoid causing harm through our sexual con, dash, duck, and to be aware of the consequences and impact of our sexual activity and desire. 4. We set the intention of being honest of not lying, and of not using speech in a harmful way. 5. We set the intention to avoid the use of intoxicants and intoxicating behavior that cloud our awareness. We need to continually reflect on and question the intentions behind our actions. We may have moments of clarity, but these can quickly pass, when old habits or thoughts resurface, we commit to con, dash, stantly reminding ourselves of our intention to wise action, to act in, ways that are non-harming, inquiry of wise action, colon, have you acted in a way that was unskillful or that created suffering, how, during those times you were unskillful or created suffering, how would it have changed the outcome if you had acted out of calm, dash, passion, kindness, generosity, and forgiveness? Would you now have a different emotional or mental response to your past actions if you had acted with these principles in mind? First precept. Have you caused harm? How? Allow for a broad understanding of harm, including physical, emotional, mental, and karmic harm, such as financial, legal, moral, microaggression, or any of the isms, and phobias such as racism, sexism, ableism, classism, homophobia transphobia, etc. Even if you can't point to specific harms that you have caused, have you acted in a way that purposely avoided being aware of the posi dash ability of harm. Second precept. People take, in many ways, we take goods or material possessions. We take time and energy, we take care and recognition. With this broad understanding of taking, have you taken what has not been freely given?
given. How? What are specific examples or patterns where this has been true for you? Third precept. Have you behaved irresponsibly, selfishly, or without full consent and awareness from yourself or partners in your sexual conduct? How? Reviewing your sexual partners or activities, have you been fully aware in each instance of other existing relationships, prior or current? Dash rent mental or emotional conditions of yourself and your partners and your own intentions in becoming sexually involved how or how not has your sexual activity both by yourself and with others been based on non-harmful intentions have you entered into each sex suit dash Al activity with awareness and understanding. How or how not? Fourth precept. Have you been dishonest? How? What patterns did your dishonesty take? Did you act or speak this? Dash. Honestly to deny or misrepresent the truth about your own behavior or status. Were there particular situations in which your dishonesty was par, dash, particularly present, for instance, when dealing with your addictive be, dash, behaviors, in job or professional settings, among friends, with family? Investigate the source of the dishonesty in each setting, was it based? On greed, confusion, fear, denial. Why were you lying? Fifth precept. Have you used intoxicants or other behaviors that cloud your ability to see clearly? What substances and behaviors have you become reliant on to change or cloud your awareness? Has this changed over time? Time, 4. If you have periods of abstinence, were your habitual intoxicants or behaviors replaced by other ways to avoid awareness of your present circumstances and conditions? How? List ways you might practice the five precepts, compassion, loving case, dash, inness, and generosity in your decision-making. Wise livelihood. The final factor in the ethical group is wise livelihood, which focuses on how we support ourselves in the world. Again, the intent is to avoid causing harm. For most of us, our work occupies so much of our time and attention, so how we choose to make a living takes on special importance. Understanding the principle of karma, and knowing that an ethical activity gives rise to harmful karma, whatever choices or circumstances lead us to a particular job need to be recognized as having karmic consequences. We try to avoid jobs that give rise to suffering and seek work. That does no harm or reduces suffering. The Buddha mentions five kinds of livelihood to avoid. Trading in weapons or instruments of killing, trap, dash, picking in or selling human beings, killing of other beings, making war, selling addictive drugs, our business in poison. We're encouraged to avoid occupations based on dishonesty or injury. Whatever our job is, we can practice it mindfully, with an in dash tension of non-harm, of easing suffering, and of compassion. This means Developing an attitude toward our occupation beyond just the money we make, we can develop an approach of service and caring about the effects of our actions on others, 
both within and outside our workspaces. Wise. Livelihood is not about judging ourselves or others for their choice of work or trying to limit their choices. Instead, we try to understand why and how we engage in whatever occupation we practice, whatever work we do, we can maintain an intention of benefiting others. Inquiry of Wise Livelihood, colon, does your job cause harm? What is the specific nature of that harm? How can you do your job more mindfully and with an intention of compassion and non-harm? Do you bring an understanding of karma and kindness to your job? Or do you compartmentalize it and exclude it from awareness of wise action? What part does greed play in the choices you make in your living? Dash, could, does greed get in the way of awareness or compassion? How can you be of service in your community? How might you bring a spirit of generosity to your life, both in your profession and outside it? Wise effort. Wise effort is the first of the concentration group. It means concentrating our effort on understanding and recovery and awakening. Wise effort isn't based on how much we should meditate, how much service we should do, or how much time we put into healthy activity. Instead, it's the intention to devote balanced energy to supporting the other parts of the path, particularly wisdom. The first thing to pay attention to is avoiding situations and states of mind that can lead to an ethical, unskillful, or harmful response. Dash, S. We become more aware of conditions in our lives and investigate our own responses and reactions to those conditions. When we're operating out of greed, ignorance, confusion, or thinking we can get what we want, we need to be aware of that. We put in the effort and energy to under dash understand what circumstances allow these conditions to arise and how we can begin to move away from those responses. Energy or effort is also devoted to letting compassion, loving K, dash, inness, generosity, and forgiveness arise when they're not present. If we find ourselves reacting with anger rather than compassion, fear instead of generosity, blame instead of forgiveness, we can ask how we would respond if those positive factors were present, and begin to respond more skillfully, being hard on ourselves, beating ourselves up, and suffering from perfectionism or all familiar feelings during addiction and recub. Dash. Hurry. When we shame ourselves for not being good enough, not trying hard enough, not being enough, these are perfect opportunities to crack. Dash. Tice wise effort to reflect on the question, in this moment, how can I be kind and gentle with myself? In early recovery, we may be most interested in damage control. Simply stopping the destruction and demoralization we have suffered through our habitual, unskillful responses to craving. We can begin by awareness of that craving and learning to make different choices that don't trigger the craving. Sometimes awareness is enough. Sometimes, that's all the effort we can muster, as we learn more skillful responses to our triggers, we gain space to have more compassion, loving kindness, 
generosity and forgiveness, and as this practice becomes more of a habit, equanimity and peacefulness begin to replace our habits of grasping and selfishness, casing ourselves as important, alternating periods of activity and rest. We need to be aware of what our mind, emotions, body, and recovery can handle right now, and avoid the stress that can come from pushing ourselves too far, too fast. We need to avoid those things that put us into unskillful mind states, and try to do things that return us to a more easeful way of being in the present moment. Try to remember that whatever your experience is right now, it will pass. Remind yourself that you don't really know how long an unpleasant or painful experience will last. Try to be open to recognizing and investigating the experience while it is present, without interpreting. It is a permanent part of your experience. Recognizing that the craving, experience, or thought will pass makes it easier to avoid the impulse to make an immediate, unskillful response. Inquiry of wise effort, colon. What efforts have you made to connect with a wise friend, mentor? Or Dharma buddy who can help you develop and balance your EF. Dash. Force. Think of a situation that is causing you discomfort or unease. What is the nature of the effort you're bringing to the situation? K. Adam. Dash. T on to whether it feels balanced and sustainable, or if you're leaning too far in the direction of either inactivity or overexertion. Are you dealing with overwhelming desires, aversions, laziness or discouragement, restlessness and worry, or doubt about your own ability to recover? How do these hindrances affect the choice of your making? Are you avoiding feelings by checking out and giving up, or through Obsessive busyness and perfectionism. Wise mindfulness. Mindfulness, being present to what's going on in our minds, bodies, hearts, and worlds, is central to the practice of the Eightfold Path. We learn to be present for the way things are with compassion, without judging them or ourselves. Mindfulness is being aware of what dash ever is present, noticing it, and letting it pass. It's also remembering that we're on a path leading to our freedom and long-lasting happiness. Mindfulness asks us to be aware and to investigate without the reactivity and grasping for control that leads to suffering. We learn to stay attentive to what's happening without having to either react or deny what's happening. For many of us, our addictions prevented us from being mindful. In fact, that was often the whole point. We used our substances and behaviors to avoid feeling, to avoid being aware, because being aware was painful, but by trying to avoid pain, we often creep, dash, add more suffering. We're now making a different choice, to sit with the discomfort rather than pushing it away or trying to numb it. We can learn to sit with the discomfort in different ways, either by bringing Awareness to the physical sensations that affect our bodies are in a more distant, non-attached way, such as naming the emotions while allowing them to arise and cease. We're choosing to respond to it with mindful investigation and compassion, and to trust that it will pass if we let it 
We're remembering that there's another way to respond to the difficulties of life. Our minds can get lost in how we react to experiences. When something happens, we almost immediately begin to create a story, plan, or fantasy about it. We have a thought about an experience, that thought leads to another, and on and on until we're far from a real understand. Dash. Think of the experience itself. Mindfulness is noticing the experience in that moment before we get lost in the judgment of the moment or the stories we spin about it, rather than blindly following our reactions and responses to an experience. Mindfulness allows us the space to choose to respond skillfully and from a place of wisdom and morality. Mindfulness encourages us to be open to and investigate the painful experiences and our habitual reactions to those experiences. Rather than to deny, ignore, suppress, or run from them, most of us have been conditioned to be our own harshest critic from early on, especially during our fixations on substances and behaviors. We carry the shadow of that judgment with us, even as we seek recovery, giving ourselves nega. Dash. Tie feedback and scrutinizing every effort we make, holding ourselves to impossible standards of perfection, letting go of that inner critic allows us to be mindful in the present of the efforts we are making, mindful of the compassion and loving kindness we're learning to make a part of our practice and our lives. Remember that we often talk way more harshly to ourselves than we ever would to somebody else. It's useful to notice when we're treating ourselves too harshly, and then shift attention to what we are doing well. We can acknowledge the negative thought, and then Jen, dash, TLY let it go. Mindfulness practice is based on the Satipatthana Sutta, or the four foundations of mindfulness. Dot, C. First foundation, mindfulness of the body, asks us to bring awareness, attention, or focus on our breath, and to bodily sensations. Meditations on the breath and body are focused on this awareness. The second foundation is mindfulness of feeling and feeling tones. Dot. This practice involves noticing the emotional tone, plea, dash, sure or displeasure, that comes with every sensation, even when the sensation is a thought. It also encourages us to notice when a sensation is neither pleasant nor unpleasant but feels neutral. For example, we can Experience inhales and exhales by noticing where in our body we feel the breath most directly. The second foundation instructs us to notice those sensations that are neutral, as well as those that are pleasant or unpleasant. The third foundation, mindfulness of the mind, asks us to notice when attachment also known as greed or wanting, comes up, and to be aware that attachment arises in the mind. We also learn to notice when the mind is not attached to a particular thought or sensation. The same practice of noticing applies when we become aware of aversion, which we can experience as resistance or even hatred. When aversion isn't present in the mind, we can notice that the mind is free from aversion. In the fourth foundation, 
of mindfulness, mindfulness of Dom Dash Moss. <laughs>